What's up, horror fans? Anchor Pete here, and I'm with my friend and co-host, Danny, Dr. Zayas, G-O-D. And tonight, we have a very special guest. We have Max Booth III. He's a prolific writer. He's written a bunch of novels and novellas. He has also edited a bunch of anthologies. And there is a movie out this weekend, which is based on his book. And he wrote the screenplay for it. You probably know the movie. It's We Need to Do Something. And so, Max, thank you for being on the show. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. I hope the sound of my dog licking his balls was caught on that. He was doing it the entire time you talked, just so loud and wet. <laughs> it was really rude of him. I apologize. I'm doing great. Am I in the bathroom? Is that what that background is? Okay, so here's the deal, right? Is that I wanted to have a bathroom from your movie, like yeah. as the, the wallpaper. And uh, I only found one image, right? And so I didn't want to take that image because I thought it might be like copywritten. So I just took a picture of my bathroom. Nice. In the book, that's way more realistic to the type of bathroom it is. Like I based it on the bathroom in my house. It's really, really small compared to what the movie bathroom ended up being. Yeah. Well, I, I totally fucked up this background too because like <laughs> our little podcast thing is right where you are. And then yeah. I actually have your poster because your poster for your movie is fantastic too. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's it's supposed to be up at the top, but then me and Danny are blocking it. <laughs> the, poster, the poster has kind of like, it, it, it just screams like Phantom of the Paradise vibes. And I, I love like the, the dark shading around the eye. Really old school feel. Love it. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you guys liked it. I I wasn't totally sure what to think of it when I feel, saw that post. But it's grown on me, definitely. I think they sent us like, 15 different ideas for postals and that was definitely the best one by a little J Milgen. I've kind of done like a deep dive of your stuff within the past uh, few days. Oh no. Because, um, <laughs> you know, da Danny and I, um, you know, we usually review horror movies, right? And so we just started reviewing current horror novels. And so, um, like I said, you, you've done so many different books already and anthologies and um, you know, like I, we just kind of want to become familiar with your stuff right and get to know you a little more um like for instance like i was wondering just as a writer for example you um like you have these anthologies that you edit and you write your novels too like do you do those on separate days do you like read the um do you do your writing first in the day and then edit anthologies like how does that work so i uh i do not have any type of schedule even though I would like to, I'm envious of those who have like a set schedule. Like I do, I'll do this from this time and I'll stop and do something else. My brain is really chaotic inside. And I often am just scrambling to get whatever I remember next needs to be done. So I often do not get as much writing done as I want to, because anytime I try to write, all I can think about is like all of the editing and publishing stuff I need to get done. And I, I've only been writing and like publishing as my only job for about a 10, 11 months now. Before that, I was doing a night shift at a hotel. So since quitting that job and like trying to do this as the only job, I've come up with somewhat of a schedule. It's not like that organized. I try to do some writing when I wake up. I try to wake up about 6, 7 a.m. I try to write until we have breakfast. And then after that, I'm doing uh, publishing stuff, which um, involves doing editing until pretty much until I like eat, until we eat dinner at like at five or six or whatever. And then I'll try to do some more writing or just watch a movie or something. Right now, I'm not getting shit done because we just got a puppy. And it turns out puppies are a goddamn handful, man. <laughs> 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 Who would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> So like I've even doing a podcast has been super difficult. Like I've done maybe two episodes of my podcast since getting the dog and half the time I'm having to hit mute on my end just to stop him from like chewing on like my, my shoes. <laughs> Your wife is a editor as well, right? Yeah. Together we run the publishing company, Perpetual Motion Machine. So I do like, I do most of the editing with the books 
and she does all the layout, the design of the inside of the books. And we do two magazines. We do Deal with Moon Digest, which comes out uh, full times a year. And then we also do a uh, an annual magazine called Night Frights, which is like, like YA spookiness. And she is the editor-in-chief of both of those magazines. She's really in charge of both of those. But I help out with some of the editing and some of the slush reading. Oh, okay. Dude, we have to, Danny and I have to check out the young adult one because, like, we both have uh, daughters that are, like, just, like, preteen age, you know, and yeah. they're really getting into horror right now, too, so. Oh, nice. We're about to put out the second issue, so if you send me your address after this, we can send you some copies. We'll just say it on the, the just, just say your address on the YouTube show, on the podcast. Just say it so, like, the public knows. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. cool. I, I wanted to ask you a really generic question. Um whenever we get a chance to interview somebody uh especially because we're basically a horror channel i the the horror fan in me just wants to know what got you started in horror what was like your gateway into horror when you were younger that yeah. got you started writing and then what whether it was a book an author or movies tv yeah absolutely so i mean i was I was into the genre at a really young age because I had uh, bretholds, old old little bretholds who were into the genre. So they would always play it when I was around. And I just drifted to that immediately. Like I'm thinking right now of the Evil Dead franchise specifically is what I really like got attached to as a young, young child. I'm talking like five, maybe at the oldest. <laughs> I loved it so much. Um, movies like The Gate, anything with like like cool like claymation stuff going on i was a big fan of book wise i began like with goosebumps and like christopher pike and then i moved on to stephen king mostly because i was in love with the movie stand by me and then i found out oh it's also a book i need to read that and that led to me reading everything by stephen king um I don't know exactly what got me into writing something i say sometimes in interviews is when i was like seven six i don't know i had a dog who uh who died and i was super devastated as a kid and to like deal with that i began writing these eventuals of myself and the dog like going into the woods and fighting bad guys that is true but i don't know if i was already writing before that anyway i don't have like any recollection of the day i decided i'm gonna try to write now I think I just watched a lot of movies about people who did write, and I thought that was super cool. <laughs> like um, <laughs> a movie I was obsessed with at a super young age, and it's really funny to think about now, is um, the adaptation of Stephen King's Misery. And something about like <laughs> being like abducted and held hostage in a room and being told just to write every day sounded like super romantic to me as a young child. And I was like, this could happen to me and that would be cool. I do not like going to school. And if I could just sit home all day, that's like heaven. So <laughs> I think it, I don't know. It's like you, the, my brain like digested all these movies about people who write and it just became the coolest thing imaginable in my head i began with like creating things i recall drawing and writing my own shitty comic books and selling them on the school bus for like 25 cents they will not good because i do not know how to draw but it was some it was probably my phil's case of publishing and selling something to a customer base which is pretty funny to think about. I um, have never written a comic since. Ah, that's Do you ever want to write a comic? I have ideas. I have, I have ideas for comics. I might get around to eventually. I like. I have some good illustrable friends who I know who could knock the hell out of it if I did write it. It's just one of those things on the list of projects to get to eventually. You said that on your podcast. You said that uh, that was the first time you're book has been uh narrated right for mm -hmm. uh we need to do something right so you had uh linda jones as the narrator right and i thought she did an actually an excellent job yeah like are you able to pick who's going to be the narrator on your book or does like the company assign it to you so w with this case specifically i don't know how it usually is because i'm the publisher i own the audio rights and everything i was able to pick but also, Linda Jones is a friend of mine, actually. 
I, I knew Hill already, and I knew that this was his job. So I reached out to Hill when I knew I wanted to make this an audio book, and I said, "Linda, help me. Tell me what to do. I will pay you, and you can make this, and we can. Yeah, I'll, I will just follow your lead." And she was really kind to me, and she helped. She also lives in Brooklyn, by the way, with uh, her husband John C. Fossil, who is a great writer. I've published many of his books. I, I used an Audible credit uh, to get the book yesterday, and it was f a four-hour listen. And I was lucky I had to do the laundry this morning. And I, <laughs> I got through the entire story uh, th today. And I had just finished watching the movie yesterday. And I was blown away by her job reading it. Yeah. And I was also blown away by just how similar the story is to the screenplay. Um, it was so it, I, I was just going to ask, like, when you're adapting your own story, like, how do you go about, uh, you know, are you, are you in charge of like cutting out certain things or was there anything that you, because I, I, I was telling Pete, I, I'm struggling to think of any like really big sections of the book uh, yeah. that were left out of the screenplay. So did you have like anybody, uh, you know, obviously the director kind of telling you, what needed to go and what needed to stay how um how much can we spoil on this show i'm okay with spoiling anything but i don't know what you guys want to do Here, here's here's the answer to that question attention viewers we are going to have spoilers for we need to do something watch the movie read the audible read the book and then come back and watch the rest of this okay. there you go now you can spoil everything so the only like main difference is like the, the biggest difference in my head is in the book the dad eats his son and that does not happen in the movie. So that's a, that's the biggest one. And also the dad is kind of a different character in the book because he's really much a Texan in the book and he's not in the movie. So yes. there's a lot of like right wing conspiracy talk going on with them in the book that I had fun writing. It's just that fun <laughs> kill till the right. And that's not really too much in the movie, but, um, when I was writing the screenplay, I have a film and TV manager named Ryan Lewis. So he's like a Gildian angel, basically. He knows how to get shit done. So he read the book. He said, this would make a great movie. I think I could sell it if you write the screenplay. So it was, a, it was just me writing the screenplay, sending it to him, him giving me notes about what he thought, and then doing mill drafts along the way, which took like two months. And to do that, basically, I went through the book and I made an outline of every important like plot thing that happens in the book and i made it like in a bullet point list and if something i thought didn't really move the move the, the movie along i just deleted it and i don't really think those many things i removed from the book i definitely rearranged some things to make it kind of flow smoothly as a movie like for instance the um the snake bite with Bobby and the, like the unknown man. And I think something else happens in that fucking crazy scene. Those didn't happen together in the book. They will spread out differently. I, I kind of prefer how it happens in the movie just because it gives a great little sense of chaos. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the uh, decision to make the dad not eat the boy would <laughs> was something I was against. <laughs> I was like, no, we have to have him meet the kid. But uh, my, <laughs> manager, my manager was like, I don't think I can sell this script to, to a company if a boy gets eaten. And I was like, good point. We can, we can, we can tell him that. <laughs> let, let me tell you, I, and Pat Healy, man, I could have seen him eating everyone in that room. <laughs> uh, I, I've seen a lot of disgusting things in horror movies. When Pat Healy puts those alcohol pads in his mouth, I I almost started like like covering my mouth as the writer of the story and then the writer of the screenplay. Do you have any say in like or did you have any uh, yeah, did you have any say in like the casting? Like did you know as you were write as you were writing the screenplay who you wanted to play these characters? So I I wrote this book and screenplay. Well, I wrote the kill until when I was writing it, I was visualizing it as a movie. I, it, when I was writing the book, I had no way of knowing it would actually become a movie. 
Mm -hmm. But I, of course, I have an actor in mind just because that's how I write. And I definitely wrote it with Nicolas Cage in mind because it's it's that type of role, I think. Yeah. Um, But I didn't know it was going to be a movie until after I put the book out. I mean, I put the book out and then I wrote it as a screenplay. And then I said, okay, uh, Ryan, who's my manager, try to sell it. I did not think he would just because that seemed like a impossible thing for me to, to get to. Like, I, I'm not a movie guy. I'm just a book guy. But he, um, within like, I think I sent it, him the final draft in May. And then in July, I was having a meeting with Sean King O'Brady, who directed the movie. And he was like, I read the script, Ryan sent it to me. I love it. I want to make it. So that's how quickly it kind of happened. And then we began having conversations about cast. And I was involved pretty with all of the cast, actually. I'm the one who um, gave them the idea of who the cast for Melissa. I, uh, I texted the, a bunch of the producers and the director, and I said, guys, you have to watch a movie called The Vast of Night because the, the, the woman who's in that is incredible. And she is so good at doing long stretches of dialogue, which is what we need for this type of movie. So... I, I will take responsibility on that one. Dude, I totally did not make that connection. And I, I love that friggin' movie. And I, I reviewed that movie, too, on my other channel. Holy shit, I didn't realize that's the same actress. Yeah, that's man. That's crazy. She was also in, do you watch Cool Buell Enthusiasm? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was also in that as a young little kid. She was the, ah, uh, man, I, I feel so disgusting for saying this. She was the kid who had a rash on her pussy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah! I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Oh, I, I feel was she, she was in on Supernatural too, right? Yeah, I was she looking was at her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, wow. she's she's okay. awesome, man. I think she's gonna really blow up, especially yeah, no with kidding. that Fast and Night performance. That was something else. Uh, yeah, with Pat Healy, that was a suggestion. But that was a suggestion by the director Sean, because yeah. um, Sean runs Atlas Industries. And they recently produced a movie called Dental in America, which is a really good movie. I don't think it's out in the U.S. yet, but I've, I've seen a copy because I'm awesome. But it's out in the <laughs> U.K. And it's like a punk rock type of movie. And Pat Healy plays like this really like jolky suburban dad in it. He's not like the main dude in it, but he's in a few scenes. So they had that connection already. So like Sean texted us like, what about Pat Healy for this role? And we were like, yes, he would be perfect. Yeah, and yeah. luckily he said yes. And I don't know how they got Vanessa Shaw in it, but I was super stoked because Vanessa Shaw is awesome. She was an eyes wide shut for crying out loud. And yeah. um the with John James Cronin and Lisette Alexis, those little audition tapes. So we all of us basically watched like hundreds of audition tapes on like uh google cloud drives and we <laughs> found the, the right ones with let's with the amy kill so that was such a difficult one to find because we didn't know what we wanted but we knew like if we watched something we knew that wasn't right and then when we saw the set all of us at once like texted each other in the group chat saying that's the one that's who we need <laughs> and <laughs> it, she was just great and i think that was like a little phil's movie too so i think she's gonna really blow up as well you know, that's really interesting, right? Because you said that you guys didn't know what you wanted, right? But, like, as the person that, like, essentially created the character from scratch, right? Yeah. Like, when you envision your characters, do you see them look a certain way when you're going to write them in your novella or your novel? Sometimes, yeah. With Amy specifically, I didn't really have a clear idea of what she looked like because in the book, it's really dreamlike and, like, fuzzy memory stuff when we talk about Amy. So she never, like, became this clear image in my head yeah yeah interesting yeah well how'd you get ozzy osbourne um i have no idea man that wasn't me that that happened way like in almost till the end of filming i think one of the producers came into the editing room well, myself and the uh, shane patrick field who edited the movie we were in the room and the producer came in and said by the way we have ozzy now and we were like shut the fuck up no we don't <laughs> I, if I had to guess, um, one of the producers on the movie is Donovan Leach, um, who is connected to the music industry. He was also in the 1988 remake of The Blob. And if I if I had to guess, he probably knew Ozzy and made the connection. But I don't know for certain how that happened. Holy shit. 
yeah, yeah. and then like one of the producers is uh josh mallerman too right yeah dude josh is a good friend of mine he's the one who connected me with ryan that's ryan's manager and i was um i was getting some emails from a different company a tv company about a different book of mine called touch the night and i did yeah. not know how to answer those questions so i reached out to josh and i said i need help and he connected me with ryan and now my life is not bad <laughs> <laughs> with josh i mean i had talked to him online for a long time i mean both of the debut novels came out in the same year. Um, but I didn't meet him until I drove down to Michigan for the film shoot. And the day I went to his house, I actually went to his, I broke like the COVID uh, safety precaution rule of staying in the hotel because I uh, accidentally uh, destroyed the washing machine at the hotel and I had no clothes. <laughs> I can go I can to that if you want. I, um, I basically I, I put too many clothes into the washing machine and then it flooded and <laughs> and I had oh. no clothes then. Um, so oh, the shit. next day I uh, took all my clothes to Josh's house to do laundry and we spent the day just like talking about the genre and how much we love spooky shit. It was just a nice, cool like hangout of a friend I've had for a long time, but I haven't hadn't met until then. But of course, because I broke the uh, COVID bubble, I had to stay in my hotel for the next two days without being on set. But it was built in, I think. Um, you know, with the whole COVID thing, too, it's kind of incredible that your movie, your story is about people being trapped together in a space. And you wrote it before COVID even happened, right? Yeah, that's like one of the biggest misconceptions I keep seeing online is like I wrote this movie as like a meta film for COVID. No, I just happen to like movies that take place in one setting. <laughs> that's just it. I just like limited settings in books and movies. And it just happened. I don't want to say I lucked out, but it was a it was a hell of a coincidence that I just had this book ready to come out when all this was going on i doubt the movie would have gotten made if covid wasn't going on just because we had people available to to help with it who probably would have been been busy with different jobs like dan rebuilt who did the the practical effects he's a really fucking famous dude in practical effects like he did the stuff on uh six feet under he did the he did all the practical effects on slivel and he wow. was just available because no one else was doing anything. So we, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. We got the team we did. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Uh, I had mentioned to Pete, one of my favorite like sub genres of horror is the contained thriller. Yeah. Um, I, I love, and I wrote down like a list of movies that not that this movie like remind just like that, that had that same vibe. I would like, I wrote down 10 Cloverfield lane, uh, it comes at night, phone booth. And like, I love movies like that where you take like regular people and you put them into a tight space and they're forced to like deal with a situation. Um, so you said you like those types of movies also, that those types of stories. Did you have anything like, was there any like in direct influence for you yeah. there? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think um, when Sean and I were like coming up with like ways to pitch this movie to this movie, the people who would fund it, I kept telling him to tell people it was the White House in a bathroom. because <laughs> The White House was a great influence on it. I love that movie so much. I love the fact that it has limited setting, but I also love the way it spiraled in the madness. The Shining was a big influence on it. Of course, I mean, you have a family stuck in a place. The dad's going nuts because of alcoholism. Right. Um, even the bathroom design is really similar to, like, the room and the training. Like, yes. if you think about where well, the tub is positioned, it's really similar the way it was uh, designed, and that's intentional. One of the things I loved about this movie is, and the, the book, is how ambiguous things are. Because you don't see, as the viewer, you don't see, or as the reader, you don't ever get a view of what happens outside that bathroom. Was there any nervousness among any of the people involved in in the film about maybe like forcing you as a screenwriter to show that kind of, because I, I know that like for movies especially, they don't like the audience walking out with questions and being ambiguous. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, no. I was just doing that. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I, ac- I actually had some produce olds ask me multiple times to write scenes. Will we see the bathroom at the end? And I refused. So, like, I have noticed a few reviews, well, a lot of reviews, like, oh, I wonder what kind of movie this would be if they had a big old budget. They could have filled the, the, the show outside the bathroom. It wasn't the budget. It was me. I'm just, I'm not, as the creative one, like, the one who made this story, I'm not interested in what's going on outside the bathroom. And it's, it's, to me, it's more about what's going on in the bathroom, and everything outside of it is... It's adding to the vibe, vibe, but I'm not too interested in showing too much because that's not really what the book and movie is about. Also, something it's kind of a motto of mine is when writing something, I like to explain as little as possible because I think that's kind of, I don't know, it's not interesting. I like what I really like is to get a bunch of kill tools like sitting around smoking cigarettes, drinking, and trying to solve what is going on by just like guessing and coming up with your own ideas, but Neville straight up saying, yes, this idea is the correct idea because I don't like that. I It's way more fun for me to have people, the kill tools guessing about what's going on, but Neville actually finding out with a hundred percent certainty. So, so yeah, I mean, I had a lot of producers kind of like, why don't you just write that scene and we could film it, but we don't have to use it just in case. And I said, no, because if I do that, you will definitely going to use it. <laughs> it's, it's, it. Really, it's really funny. You said that. Cause I, I brought up one of the movies that this reminded me of a little bit was 10 Cloverfield lane and my least. And I love that movie so much until the very ending when you go outside and you get to see what's happening. And then I went, Oh, Okay. Yeah. And I would have loved if the movie just ended with like her getting out and then the movie just faded to black. Like, yeah. so I, I did love that part of like the, the ambiguity and, and that again, like the, the seamlessness of the, the book to the, to the screenplay was amazing. Oh, thank you. And I agree. I love that movie too until the end. And so <laughs> I feel like yeah. sometimes no, no matter what you do, it's not going to be as good as what the audience is imagining is going to happen. And right. going revealing too much is a way for just disappointment. Yeah. yeah. Did, did the cast members, like, as they're getting into their characters, because they're, they're the people that are sitting around the room, maybe not smoking cigarettes, but, like, did they speculate? Did they have their own kind of theories, too? They all have different ideas, I'm told, about what's going on, but I haven't found out what those uh, speculations might be i didn't get to talk to the cast too much on set mainly because of covid stuff because if any of them got sick we would have been fucked we didn't have money around like that like if someone in the crew got sick it sounds awful but like okay we can replace them but if the cast got sick we the movie would have been fucked completely so there was a lot of like do not go by cast unless you absolutely have to so i try to stay away from them as much as possible i think the person i talked to the most was was vanessa just because i kept bumping into them like accidentally like at one point we were both walking to the hotel that we were staying at together so like we had a conversation that way and I, well, this is pretty funny i think i was on set till the uh the ending scene of the movie and Vanessa walks in from the, the, the rule drobe Ilya drenched in blood. And she looks at me and says, I hope this is what you imagined because I am extremely itchy right now. <laughs> so then you weren't there on the day when uh, Pat Healy had to put his son like through the door. Um, I was, so the movie was being edited at the same time it was being shot. So we had this garage where we, We'll, we will filming the movie and then mm-hmm. above because it's a giant office building they have above mm-hmm. they have a mini theater where the editor was editing the previous day's footage 
so for a main chunk of the shoot, I was up with the editor kind of going through the footage, the footage with them and like helping them make decisions with stuff like that. Mostly because the set was super claustrophobic. We had this garage and we had a giant bathroom built into it. So outside the bathroom, we had like these skinny uh, passageways that we had to like walk around and scree squeeze around um, crew members and cameras. It was not fun to be in so i mostly hung out with the um in the editing room and the scene will pat squeezes <laughs> john james's head through the door i was not on set when that happened but i do recall being on set like a, like a right before they filmed it so i i remember like the, the stuntman they had, like walking through how how they would do that without killing him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's funny though, like being in the editing room when them when Shane was doing that scene specifically was gruesome because you have to watch the same cut over and over and over and listen to the same sounds. And the oh. sound of John James like squealing like a pig was and it was too much for me. Like halfway through, I was like, I got to get up and go to my hotel room. I can't do that. And yeah. she was like, you wrote this. You made this happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that that's cool about the set. You know, I kind of figured that it would be something like that. And you're right. It, it does. That totally reminds me of The Shining, too, the, the bathroom itself. Yeah. Um, and I know that on your podcast, you said that, like, you guys were going to like give away pieces of that set right after you broke it down. Yeah, so after they, after filming wraps, they took the bathroom, demolished it, and threw it all in a dumpster. And I saw that the next day, and I thought, I'm going, I'm going to take some of this because I have ideas for the future. So I got my kill, and I backed up next to the dumpster. And I took, like, three sections of the wall and just threw it in my trunk because I, I live in Texas, and this was in Michigan, and I drove to Michigan. So I drove yeah. all, this, all these damn pieces of a bathroom wall <laughs> across the country and yeah, I'm doing like a limited edition of the book, which will have the the novella and the screenplay in it. And like, I think it's the first 70 people who buy it will also get a chunk of the bathroom. I have, no, I have no idea if IFC is okay with that, but I think we well, <laughs> do it because it was trash. So that, you know, we really loved your movie, right? And, um, it, you know, it sounds like that Touch the Night, another one of your novels was in the process of being optioned for a movie or is that not happening? It's I'm in the process of negotiating with a company about potentially making something with it. But that's yeah. all I can say right now. Nothing is signed or agreed upon. I mean, it might happen. It might not. Um, I'm just glad I now have like a, an, an entertainment loyal who can handle that stuff because I, I don't want to deal with it. So he's, he's busy fighting away with the company to, to give everybody a good deal. So maybe it might happen. I don't know. Cool. Um, you know, so Danny and I, we, like I said, we, we mainly review movies on here and, and occasionally TV shows too. But, you know, we are trying to expand and, and review modern horror books. Like, do you recommend Touch the Night as the next book of yours that we should take on? I think it's a pretty good book of mine. I mean, I think I can be pretty honest, like with the, the quality of my books. I have maybe seven novels out. I think Touch the Night is definitely an improvement of we need to do something. I I, I think it's better at least. So yeah, I would say so. If you like if you it's definitely my best book in this genre, I would say. It's pretty fast paced. It has some some pretty gruesome body uh splattle stuff going on. Um demons, if you like demons, lots of demonic shit and possessions. Oh, okay. I do. <laughs> Speaking yeah. my language. There you go. <laughs> you know, Max, I, I had a really good time talking to you. I appreciate you like taking the time to just like explain all this stuff to us. It's cool to see like behind the scenes for the, the writing aspect and also just the filmmaking aspect. Um, did you want to just go ahead and like just plug some of your stuff for our viewers? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need to do something is out now and limited theaters. If you can find a place playing it by you take advantage of it because I shall fuck can't. Um, <laughs> um, also, I'm um, through my press perpetual motion machine. I am releasing the debut novel of Lisa Quigley, which is called the fillest and it comes out in October. So go to perpetual publishing.com to find all the books. I, I put out all the books I publish. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, man. Well, it's been a real pleasure and we're hoping that like, 
you know, if you want to come back on after we read, um, you know, Touch the Night or one of your other works, maybe we could all discuss it together. I'm, I'm game. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Awesome, man. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much for coming on.